Welcome, everyone. So glad that you guys could join us for Life of a Poet this evening. My name is Lila. I'm on the programming team here at Hill Center. Um, how many of you guys have, are here for the first time this evening? A couple of you? Well, welcome. We're so glad that you could join us. Um, as you may or may not know, Hill Center does a wide variety of programming, not only Life of a Poet with Library of Congress, but also um, political talks and Q&As, um, cooking classes, language classes, visual arts, um, music, everything under the sun for children. Um, so please go online, check out our calendar. We've got print materials downstairs as well. Um, this evening we're here with Ron Charles and Marilyn Chin and um, introducing them will be Rob Caster Casper of the Poetry and Literature Department at the Library of Congress. Thanks everyone, thanks Lila. Um, if you could turn up Marilyn's just a little bit. Make sure that everybody can hear you. Here's my nicely crumpled little intro. Um, it's wonderful to have you all here tonight. Uh, I'm thrilled to kick off the fifth season of our Life of a Poet series. It's hard to believe we've been doing it for five years. Um, thanks to Diana Ingraham and everyone here at the Hill Center for helping make this possible. And of course, thanks to Ron Charles for continuing on with this series. Uh, I feel like, this is what I wrote, uh, I feel like I can't even brag about Ron's turn to poetry anymore. Oh, you can. But I can't, I can't. Instead, I can say he's become legendary for his in-depth conversation with poets here at the Hill Center over the last five years. Leg I wanted to say legend uh, and mean it. Uh, before I go any further, let me tell you a little bit about the Poetry and Literature Center at the Library of Congress. We are home to the Poet Laureate Consultant in Poetry, and we put on programs like this uh, here at the Hill Center and at the uh, library's Capitol Hill campus and around the country. Uh, we'd love to have you come to more of our programs. Uh, so if you want to check us out, you can go to www.loc.gov poetry. We've also passed out a little survey that you all should have, which we'd love to have you fill out. Uh, you can hand them to me afterwards. We'd love to know what you think of the program. Uh, the rest of the PLC staff is in the front. You can hand them uh, your, the, the surveys too. We'll all be happy to get them. Today, uh, if you don't know, is the start of the fiscal year uh, in terms of the federal government, of which we are a part. And I can't imagine a better way to start FY19 than to kick off this year's LOPE season. We call it LOPE in the office. Uh, and I couldn't be more excited to introduce tonight's feature poet, Marilyn Chin. I have heard Marilyn read only twice, and only briefly, at a Brooklyn book party to celebrate the launch of her 2014 collection, Hard Love Province, and the year before when she read as part of then poet laureate Natasha Trethaway's closing event, Necessary Utterance, Poetry is Cultural Force. I'll never forget seeing her up on the Coolidge Auditorium stage reading poems with such necessary force that it seemed like they might blow the speakers. Hers are poems willing to face up to death and loss and also unabashed in their lyric playfulness. They can be bawdy and prophetic and sorrowful, can dazzle with wild images and be joyously talky, can feel steeped in history and form and also charged with challenges to our moment. Listening to her then, I thought only, I want to hear more. And luckily, here we are. Please join me in welcoming Marilyn Chin. Oh. Thank you so much for coming. Oh, thank you. Thank you for thank loving poetry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank all of you for coming, too. And if you can't hear it sometime, just call out. It's very informal, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll adjust. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. oh, OK. Yes. Can I a little more? Let me put it here. Okay. I want to thank Rob for being such a cheerleader for poetry. We got to give him a. Yes. <laughs> One of your early poems begins uh, Beginning is always difficult. But the beginning of this conversation doesn't feel difficult because I've spent all week in conversation with you and your work. Uh, but it's all been one way, and now I'm so looking forward to asking you about this. Uh, I want to start with this incredible event that starts early in your life, where your folks move from Hong Kong to the United States, and you eventually settle in Portland. Why did they do that, and how did you feel about it? Oh, God. 
I don't know, I was a child, I guess I had no, <laughs> no power in those decisions. I was born in, in Hong Kong in 1955 in a cold water flat, if you remember those, in colonial Hong Kong, and, and there were open sewers, there were 15 of us in a small apartment, and, um, and it was very, yeah, and my, um, uh, my father was already in the U.S. He, he, was, he worked in various restaurants in what, what I call Piss River, Oregon. <laughs> or, uh, <laughs> various restaurants in, in Portland, Oregon. And, um, and so, um, so we, we came as, uh, yeah, um, the family came shortly after, um, af yeah, um, after um, he, you know, he first went to the U.S. and then then he uh, brought my mother and, and the family and over. And how old were you? I was seven years old. So you were, you know what was going on. You, you yeah, I you. guess so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was, um, and when I was very young, my, um, I remember my grandmother carrying me on her back. And she came little, too? Yeah, the whole family came. Okay. And she, uh, she used to sing Chinese poems. She used to chant Chinese poems. She was, she was illiterate, but she had uh, a, a prodigious memory and she memorized uh, various po uh, poems from the uh, from the Tang Dynasty and uh, and Confucius sayings and uh, she was uh, she was incredible uh, and then um, she used to walk you know uh, carry me around on her back and so the f very first words I heard were poetry yeah and and yeah and and I've loved the I've loved poetry ever since so. did she speak English no did you no your mother no. Nobody spoke English. How did that come about? How did you gradually learn English? Well, when we uh, immigrated to uh, to uh, Portland, I started school. Oh. That's what ha you know. And it's really interesting how uh, first I you know I changed um, I changed um, languages several times because first I I spoke in the dialect of Tai Shan, Ta uh, and then I moved then I then we were moved to Hong Kong when I was born in Hong Kong. I spoke. Um, um, Cantonese, and then when I came to the United States, uh, you know, I learned English, and and so uh, it was pretty much a trilingual family because there were uh, dialect differences, and and nobody spoke English, so uh, you know the children served as translators. You all yeah. learned it first, and then brought it home from school. Yeah, yeah, we yeah we brought, but my mother never really hmm. yeah uh, learned English, and my grandmother didn't know a word of English. Yeah. Oh. So. You say in one piece, poetry is a vast orphanage. In another poem you write, poetry is my nunnery. Here <laughs> I am alone in my altar, self-hate, self-love, both erotic notions. What led you to write poetry and why does it sometimes feel like that a lonely place, sometimes holy, sometimes bereft? Well, you know, I think poetry uh, saved my life in many ways. I was a very lonely, quiet child and uh, and, and there was a lot of intergenerational problems, that, as you know, if you can imagine in, in a family like that. And, and I, would, um, I would read a lot of poetry. And, I, and, and a lot of the poetry, I didn't know what they meant. You know, when I was younger, I read Shakespeare, I read um, Emily Dickinson, I read, you know, I read all kinds of poetry. And I didn't know what they meant, but the, somehow they soothed me. And the poem soothed me, and I, just, I, I suppose I learned that that soothing from my grandmother, who used to chant Chinese poetry with me on her back. Um, therefore, um, um, therefore, yeah, I think I, I, that lone, you know, I'm, poets are solitary animals. We have to, you know, we we read and write. And, I mean, that's it's it's very difficult in that um, if you're a playwright or if you're uh, a dr yeah, or a write for TV. You have a lot of people to work with, right? right. But po but poets, we we sort of sit. You know, my favorite thing to do is to go to the Harvard Yenjing Library and and read, and I, it's that solitary um, that solitary conversation that I have with with the ancients, with the Tang Dynasty poets that that you know really war warms my heart. So. Yeah, which, we're poetry nerds. I love poetry. We're poetry <laughs> nerds. So what, what can I say? <laughs> well, what about your, how did your family react to this decision to go into poetry? Oh my gosh, are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> it's a long way from becoming 
An engineer or a doctor? Or yeah, a doctor, you know, doctor, lawyer, poet, you know. <laughs> oh my gosh, you, you know. Uh, gosh, I guess I had an old uncle who was crazy and, and he lived on, you know, he was uh, you the village his, idiot and then yeah. he was the poet, you know, I don't know. <laughs> and uh, I, yeah, uh, but you know, uh, when I f finally uh, found a teaching job, th you know, they felt better about that. But I was always the weird child anyway. <laughs> it was, you know. Uh, Would uh, you read uh, Poetry Camp, which I think might contain <gasps> some of that? Poetry Camp? Your family's <laughs> frustration. <laughs> well, this is, uh, a pretty, this is a new um, uh, sequence, a prose poem sequence. So, I, so it's a prose, yeah, okay. Poetry camp. Grandmother, when can I go to poetry camp? What in hell is poetry <laughs> camp? Where a bunch of teenage girls go into the woods to write poetry. I know what teenage girls do in the woods and it's not poetry. <laughs> You may not go to poetry camp. You must scrub the soy sauce off the walls of the restaurant, then study for the SAT exam. Grandmother, what if I spurn you and go to poetry camp? Then you will shame your ancestors with your foolish dreams, and in your vain attempts to change your destiny, you will trip and fall off your platform shoes, break your neck, and amount to nothing. This is the grandmother. <laughs> I mean, just how, how supportive. Yeah, yeah she that's is. pretty yeah. pretty encouraging. Uh, <laughs> <coughs> you write so movingly and sometimes very wittily about the pain of assimilation. Oh, in um, many in many poems. In a short poem called Prelude, dedicated to your mother, you write, "Although the country is lost, rivers and mountains remain, and we shall always live in this poetry that you love." That, that first line uh, is actually from Du Fu, from the Tang Dynasty uh, poet Du Fu. And it goes, Guo Po San He Zai, which means, all country, although the country is lost, rivers and mountains remain. It is such an amazing line. It's, it, you know, it says all on that one, in those five characters. And, um, and, and, yeah, and I, I feel that I've lost many countries, um, but rivers and mountains remain. There's some, yeah, there is. And the poetry remains. The, re the poetry remains, yeah. Um, if you'd read this poem, we're in we're, uh, we are Americans now. Yeah, these are early poems. I wrote them in my 20s. <laughs> okay. He, he digs up all this dirt. Okay. <laughs> uh, we are Americans now. We live in the tundra. Today, in hazy San Francisco, I face seaward toward China, a giant begonia, pink, fragrant, bitten by vertigris and insects. I sing her a blues song. Even a Chinese girl gets the blues. Her reticence is black and blue. Let's sing about the extinct Bengal tigers, about giant pandas. Ling Ling love Xing Xing. Yet we will not mate. We are not impotent. We are important. <laughs> we blame the environment. We blame the zoo. What shall we plant for the future? Bamboo, sassafras, coconut palms? No, legumes, wheat, maize old swine to milk the new. We are Americans now. We live in the tundra of the logical, a sea of cities, a wood of cars. Farewell, my ancestors, her suit Taoist failed scholars. Farewell, my wet nurse who feared and loathed the Catholics, who called out now that the half men have occupied Canton. Hide your daughters, lock your doors. <laughs> I, they, well, I didn't have a wet nurse. <laughs> we were too poor to have a wet, but uh, apparently in that building, um, um, women would share their milk, their breast milk, because, you know, some women had problems um, 
uh, yeah, uh, with their breast milk. So yeah, I didn't, you know, I, we weren't rich enough to, have to uh, but I thought wet nurse is an interesting word. Yeah, it's that. And I love the way the poem celebrates America and mocks it at the same time. Yeah. So. I, yeah, this is when I, I started to, to be comedic here. <laughs> yes, yes. There's a poem about things you never forget called The Floral Apron. Oh, students love that poem. Well, I love it too. Yeah, I didn't remember. <laughs> they always ask, them, yeah, 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 they, it's really, it's a, yeah. The Floral Apron. The woman wore a floral apron around her neck. That woman from my mother's village with a sharp cleaver in her hand. She said, what shall we cook tonight? Perhaps these six tiny squid lined up so perfectly on the block. She wiped her hand on the apron, pierced the blade into the first. There was no resistance, no blood, only cartilage soft as a child's nose. Alas, iota of ink made us wince. Suddenly, the aroma of ginger and scallion fogged our senses. And we absolved her for that moment's barbarism. Then she, an elder of the tribe, without formal headdress, without elegance, deigned to teach the younger about the Asian plight. And although we have traveled far, we must never forget that primal lesson on patience, courage, forbearance, on how to love squid despite squid. <laughs> <laughs> how to honor the village, the tribe, that floral apron. You can see why. Oops, Oops sorry. It's, it's just, okay. It'll be fine. I think it'll be fine there. It's just your. Uh, oh your my. Oh okay. Poem is still working. Okay. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. You can see why people love that poem. It's so sensuous. It's so filled with imagery of, of sight and touch and smell. Uh, it so captures the things we do retain forever from childhood. Uh, and it's witty. It's, <laughs> it's interesting. This students either say, "Ooh, why did you have to use the image of squid?" <laughs> And, but it depends, it's really uh, culturally bound. If, if you're from Greece, you love squid. If you're <laughs> from Hong Kong, you love squid. Mm -hmm. But if you're from the Bronx, you might not like squid. Yeah. I yeah. don't know. Or maybe you, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. But, uh, but yes, it's, there's something about the kitchen table you know, it's, and mother's apron. Right. And it's, what's interesting about this poem is that for, for a time, uh, People would send me their their aprons. Oh, wow. yeah, as, you know, because I read I read this. Uh, uh, it was uh, Bill Moyers, you know, introduced uh, this poem in his uh, PBS. You know, remember his P PBS special, and and I got all these aprons from women, and and yeah, everybody remembers their mother's kitchens. Yes. You know, I think uh, that's why this poem is personal and universal. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Peculiar and and universal at the same time. Uh, a longer poem called How I Got That Name, much anthologized. Yeah, yeah, it's just, it's and one of those poems, if I don't read it, Rob would have a fit. <laughs> you know, if I don't read it at, or somebody would well, say, you gotta, you gotta read this. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've been working up to it here. Uh, is it in that, it's in that collection, number four? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Should I read the whole thing? If you don't mind. I, it is long, but I think it's so, uh, it's so good, and it, it deals with so many of your most essential themes. Uh, I usually, okay, I, uh, here it is. I, I usually perform this one. Oh. So, it's all right. Okay, I usually perform this one. <laughs> I, it, it's called How I Got That Name, an Essay on Assimilation. I am Marilyn Mailing Chin. Oh, how I love the resoluteness of that first person singular, followed by that stalwart indicative of B, without that uncertain ing of becoming. 
Of course, the name had been changed somewhere between Angel Island and the sea when my father, the paper son in the late 1950s, obsessed with a bombshell blonde, transliterated Mei Ling to Maryland. And nobody dared question his initial impulse, for we all know lust drove men to greatness, not goodness, not decency. And there I was, a wayward pink baby, named after some tragic white woman, swollen with gin and nembutal. My mother couldn't pronounce the R. She dubbed me number one female offshoot for brevity. Henceforth, she will live and die in sublime ignorance, flanked by loving children, the kitchen deity, where my father dithers, a tomcat in Hong Kong trash, a gambler, a petty thug who bought a chain of chop suey joints in Piss River, Oregon, with bootleg Gucci cash. Nobody dared question his integrity, given his nice devout daughters and his bright industrious sons, as if filial piety were the standard by which all earthly men were measured. Oh, how trustworthy our daughters, how thrifty our sons, how we managed to fool the experts in education, statistics, and demography. We're not very creative, but not adverse to rope learning, rope learning, rope learning. Indeed, they can use us, but the model minority is a tease. We know you are watching, and we refuse to give you any. Oh, bamboo shoots, bamboo shoots, the further west we go, we'll hit east. The deeper down we dig, we'll find China. History has turned its stomach on a black polluted beach where life doesn't hinge on that red, red wheelbarrow. But whether or not our new lover in that final episode of Santa Barbara will lean over a scented candle and call us a bitch. Oh Lord, where have we gone wrong? We have no inner resources. Then one redolent spring morning, the great patriarch Chin peered down from his kiosk in heaven and saw that his descendants were ugly. One had a squarish head and nose without a bridge, another's profile long and knobbed as a gourd. A third, the sad, brutish one, may never, never marry. And I, his least favorite, not quite boiled, not quite cooked, a plump pomfret simmering in my juices. Too listless to fight for my people's destiny. To kill without resistance is not slaughter, says the proverb. So I wait for imminent death. The fact that this death is also metaphorical is testament to my lethargy. So here lies Marilyn Mailing Chin, married once, twice to so-and-so, a Lee and a Wong, daughter of the virtuous Yuequin Wong and Gigi Chin, the infamous, sister of a dozen, cousin of a million, survived by everybody and forgotten by all. She was neither black nor white neither cherished nor vanquished, just in her squad her own bamboo growth, minding her poetry, when one day heaven was unmerciful and a chasm opened where she stood, like the jaws of a mighty white whale or the maw of a metaphysical Godzilla. It swallowed her whole, she not flinch, nor writhe, nor fret about the afterlife, but stayed solid as wood, happily, a little gnawed, tattered, mesmerized, by all that was lavished upon her and all that was taken away. Uh, wow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> so, That's I had to read this one for Rotten for you, my, my gosh. dear. <laughs> <laughs> that is your uh, song of myself, isn't it? Yeah, it's <laughs> yeah you're right. Yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah. Uh, a song of myself. I mean, if you're a short little Chinese <laughs> poet and you need to insert yourself into the poetry world, uh, how shall I do this? And I shall do it with uh, as loud as forceful as possible. Yeah. Um, and and uh, I, some of us, uh, I heard uh, gasping, uh, were catching uh, <laughs> references to other poems in there. Oh yes. Right? Yeah. Yes, of course. Uh, and some TV shows. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> It's uh, comic and tragic uh, to have your identity just sort of casually remade after some, as you say, tragic white woman uh, swollen yeah. with gin. Yeah. <laughs> you never changed your name back when you could have. Well, you know, because uh, I, 
you know, a Mei Ling appears in my, in my fiction and appears in the poetry as an alter ego. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, I, I don't know, because are there many uh, women named, uh, are, are you naming your kids Marilyn these days? It's really, yeah, what happened to that name? I think yeah. it's kind of an interesting name, actually. W yeah, my father was like, oh, he was, he was a rake. So <laughs> he, trans he transferred, literally, Mei Ma Ling to Marilyn. And then my sister's name was Mei Jen, and, and, and he named her Jane, uh, and after Jane Mansfield. <laughs> <laughs> So talking yeah. about bombshell blondes, I mean, it I mean, it's, uh, you know, that's a, that's yet another story. Uh, <laughs> but um, but yeah, there, those are um, twice in that poem you say no one dared question him. But yeah, you obviously question him. Oh yes, yes, <laughs> he's. You know, I am very rebellious because of of my father. Yeah, so so uh, um, so yeah, uh, but the name I. I like the name Marilyn Chin, I guess. Yeah, Mei Ling. You know, I first I started with Marilyn Mei Ling Chin, and it's a, it's a little long. Right. Uh, it, it makes Mei Ling look like an afterthought, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, like a, a translate, yeah, um, ladies or, or something like that. So, yeah. Um, you say in that poem, all was lavished upon her and all that was taken away. That's right. I mean, that's how we feel about our lives. <laughs> They were all, were all temp temporary here, right? Yes. <laughs> and I, I feel, I, you know, I feel very blessed to have all I had. You know, I, I was born in a cold water flat, and you know, I was one of one of many, you know, small little girls uh, born in that flat um, and uh, in that building. And you know, I remember the story about uh, this this you know uncle who looked at me and said, "Oh, she's so small and dark." Uh, maybe we should sell her. I mean, that, it, that was supposed to be a joke. Yes. But, you know, and so I feel so fortunate to be able to write poetry, to be, to be able to express myself, to be in this world, to celebrate poetry. I yes. mean, how, how great is that? It I mean, is. So. And that poem is, is very wry and very funny. As, as, but there's another one that deals with some of the same themes called uh, That Half is Almost Gone. Oh. Which is not funny. It's really very sad. Yeah. Actually, I, you know, I try to be funny because I, I, I'm a, a deeply depressed person. Can't you tell? <laughs> no, we cannot tell. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, that half is almost gone. That half is almost gone. The Chinese half. The fair side of the peach, darkened by the knife of time, fades like a cruel sun. In my 30th year, I wrote a letter to my mother. I had forgotten the character for love. I remember vaguely the radical heart. The ancestors won't fail to remind you. The vital and vestigial organs where the emotions come from. But the rest is fading. A dash dissects in midair. I, 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 more of a cry than a sigh and no help from the phoneticist. You are Chi a Chinese, my mother was adamant. You are a Chinese, my mother less convinced. Are you not Chinese, my mother now accepting. As the cataract clouds her vision and her third daughter marries a Protestant West Virginian who is very handsome and very kind. The mystery is still unsolved. The landscape looms over man, and the gaffer-hatted fishmonger sings to his cormorant. And the maiden behind the curtain is somebody's courtesan, or merely Rose Wong's aging daughter, pondering the blue void. You are a Chinese said my mother, who once walked the fields of her dead. Today, on the 36th anniversary of my birth, I have problems now, even with the salutation. So. Uh, 
Thank you. Yeah, very, it's a nice audience. <laughs> it's such a beautiful and harrowing image of not being able to remember the word for love when you're talking to your mom. With the character, you know, I, so I, I'm playing with, with a homophony here. I, 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 it's, it's a cry when, you know, a Chinese, when Chinese, yeah, it's a cry, but it's homophonous with I means love. And so, so, you know, I, yeah, so it's, it's a pun there. Uh, and also the visual pun, because the slash goes through the heart, the, the, yeah, the character, the uh, ideogram of heart, there's a slash that goes right, right through that character. So I'm playing with uh, the pictograph, and also playing with the sound of, of that character for love. Right. Uh, so there's, there's all, there's, you know, um, yeah, all that stuff going on. And, and when you look at the poem, um, the left, the left side, you know, the ha when I write the line, that half is almost gone. There's a break to the next line, the Chinese half. So visually, you, from, from the very first line, you see that, you know, uh, the despair, you see that cut. Um, and so I was playing visu with the visual aspects um, of the poem and the sonic, sonic uh, aspects of the poem. Right. Um, and pondering the blue void, I. I try, you know, I try to give it space, that, you know, line. So when you, you have it, so when you read it, um, you, you, you have, yeah, there's all this play with the page, the space, the space and everything. Um, so, yeah, that's, it, it's, it's really amazing how much Chinese I've lost. I, you know, I, uh, um, when I go to Beijing, go to Hong Kong, I can barely speak to people. Mm. It's just, you know, it's so mm -hmm. easy. I remember, I think it was around what, sixth grade in which English completely took over. And I started dreaming in, in English. Mm -hmm. Then I realized it took over my other half. Oh. You know, and, it, and I don't know, bilingual, uh, any of you bilingual, you, um, I don't know. Uh, so I have friends who are perfectly bilingual, but I, you know, I, I just, I th yeah, I think I'm only 80%, per 80 I'm only 20%. <laughs> So the losing the language becomes uh, combined with losing the culture, losing your ancestors. It's losing all kinds of complicated things that are wound together in that poem. Uh, in another poem you write, my loss is your loss, a dialect here, a memory there. If my left hand is dying, will my right hand cut it off? We should all be vestigial organs, the gift of democracy, the pale faces, the wan conformity. The price we pay for comfort is our mother tongue. Yes, it's, it's, it is very sad. I, I, I mourn this all, yeah, all the time. Yeah. But, uh, but it's, um, it's, it's the essential American story. Is yeah, you come it, here, it, yes, you're it, blessed with freedom and riches, and you lose this rich heritage. That's right. And then, um, and the, uh, yeah, I think now there's, you know, uh, there's this new uh, identity thing now in which, you know, poets want to write about their, their identity. Yeah identity uh, now, but I think, um, yeah, I th it, it is a problem of assimilation. It is, um, and it is, it's hard work to try to, try to keep yourself bilingual, you know, to, you know, to keep um, uh, bilingual. I mean, it's, it's very hard work and, and to keep the culture. Right, yeah. particularly when you're struggling to assimilate at the same yeah, time. Yeah, yes. And as a teenager, you want to be like everybody. You want to come home and want to be like everybody else, right? You right. don't want to um, be different, right? Identity poem number 99. Oh, okay, talking about identity, okay. Ron Charles, he's digging into these, <laughs> these poems I haven't read for years. No, okay. there aren't 98 other identity poems, are there? <laughs> well, you know, I'm just, you know, trying to be, uh, yeah, not, well. I've written a lot of identity poems. Some of them, like, are still in the drawer, right? Okay. <laughs> but the word, the number ninety-nine, there was meant yeah. ironically. No, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, identity poem ninety-nine. Are you the sky or the allegory for loneliness? Are you the only Chinese restaurant in Roseburg, Oregon? Mm -hmm. A half-breed war orphan, adopted by proper Christians. A heathen poi dog, a creamy half and half. 
Are you a dingy vinyl address book, a wrist without a corsage? Are you baby's breath, face down on a teenage road in America? Are your earphones detached, left dangling on an airplane jack to diaspora? Are you doomed to a childhood without music, weary of your granny's one-string woe-begone ear who mewling about the past? Are you hate speech or are you a lullaby? An anecdotes requiring footnotes, an ethnic joke rehashed. How many Chinese Chinamen does it take to screw how many Chinamen did it take to screw a light bulb? Are you so poor that you cannot call your mother? You have less than two dollars on your phone card and it's a long cable to Nirvana. Are you a skylight through which the bus girl sees heaven? A chopping block stained by the blood of 10,000 innocents, which daily the same bus girl must wipe off. Does existence preempt essence? I being what my ancestors were not. Suddenly, you're a vegan vegetarian. <laughs> Restaurant is a facticity, and getting the hell out is transcendence. Was the punchline incandescent? Was a nosebleed your last tender memory of her? Did he say, no dogs and China women? Are you a rose or a tattoo of fire? Oh. Hey. Well, I haven't read this one for a while, it's, Ron Charles. It's, <laughs> it's such a powerful uh, recitation and denunciation of all of those horrible slurs which you turn each one. Yeah, that's, yeah, um, yeah, there was that ethnic joke. I mean, there's, there's these jokes you hear, or these slurs you hear uh, in your childhood, and I, uh, yeah. And all these cliches about who you are, who you can be, really try and, you know, slot everyone into the, f the identities we expect them, of them. This becomes more complex when you start dating yeah, and falling yeah, in love, yeah. not with other Chinese people, much to your parents' horror. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <coughs> I love him. I hate him. I don't know how. I'm biracial. I'm torn in two, you write in one poem. He is so fair you can see the Thames pulsing in his temples. <laughs> so fair he blanched the skies of the suburbs. You love him anyway. His beauty is all you know. So fair you imagine sowing his gray children. In a parking lot, you say to Marguerite, why must I yearn for his bland porridge? <laughs> That's called weaponizing your images. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to read one stanza from the end of this poem. Uh, oh, where's number nine? Oh, oh. Voila. Did you start here? Oh, OK. There. This is your mother reacting to a young man you brought home, I think. Yeah, <laughs> okay. So you've come home finally with your new boyfriend. What's his name? Ezekiel. Odd name for a boy. Your mother can't pronounce it. And she doesn't like his demeanor. Too thin, too sallow. He does not eat beef in a country where beef is possible. He cannot play the violin in a country where rapture is possible. He beams a tawdry smile. Perhaps he is hiding bad intentions. And that moon which accompanied his arrival, that moon won't drink and is shaped naughtily like a woman's severed ear. <laughs> You didn't okay. marry him, did you? No. <laughs> oh, boy, but I did lots of creeps. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> Don't. <laughs> You're going to stand up and turn around and sit back down. <laughs> Just so they can, you know. Oh, get it, get it. They've been listening very hard. Oh, okay. They really, okay. Go on, stand up. You, stand, stand up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this isn't an intermission, though. 
We're just standing up. Now we're going to sit back down. <laughs> That's <Right>. great. <laughs> now let's keep talking about your mother. <laughs> She's such a character in these, in these poems. Uh, in a poem called Alba, you speak of uh, your mother as the moon. Uh, what a beautiful poem. Actually, actually my mo mother was a very sad character. I mean, I, f I felt that, uh, that I need to avenge my mother's death. I, I, I feel that my father ruined her life. So that's, that's I, basically, that's why I write poetry, to avenge my mother. Yeah, I don't, yeah, so. <laughs> Read that poem. Oh, yeah. Take a left at the waters of samsara. Do you know this? What samsara is? It's a cycle, yeah, of, yeah. It's a, yeah, a cycle of life and death. It's, it's, it's a reincarnation, the life, yeah, uh, a continuous reincarnation. There is a bog of sacred water behind a hedgerow of mild matter near the grave of my good mother. Tin cans blossom there. The rust shimmers like amber, a diorama of green gnats ecstatic in their veil dance. A nation of frogs regale, swell-throated, bass-toned. One belts and rages, the others follow. They fuck blissfully, trapped in their cycle of rebirth, transient love, unprepared for higher ground. And I, my mother's aging girl, myopic, goat-footed, got snagged on an unmarked trail. The road diverged. I took the one less traveled, blah, blah. <laughs> you know what I'm referring to in that line, right? <laughs> I sit at her grave for hours. A slow drizzle purifies my flesh. I still yearn for her womb and can't detach. I chant new poems my best fascicle. Stupid pupil, the truth is an oxymoron and exact. Eternity can't be proven to the dead. What is the void but motherlessness? The song bellies up, the sun taketh, the rain ceases to bless. Yeah. I still yearn for her womb and can't detach. What, uh, what was the source of your mother's unhappiness? My father. Didn't I say he was a rake? <laughs> yeah. And her situation was not uncommon, you suggest. Yeah, yeah. Uh, many, yeah. many women suffered like, from those situations. And, and she, she stopped eating and died at 62. She just you know, didn't want to live. So she was... Um, um, but she was such a good woman. She was uh, very, yeah, a very important r role model. She was um, ethic, you know, she was ethical. She was so pure. She was pure-hearted, yeah. But that poem, you know, interesting about these poems you've chosen, that poem, I, f I reread it the other day and I felt that it was a perfect poem. That there's something about the lines and how, how they were uh, carved and, um, yeah, I couldn't. Yeah, uh, I I couldn't change a thing in that poem. I mean, there's something um, about precision, in, and I learned from you know from Chinese poetry. So this is uh, pre yeah the pre the precision of the line, the precision of the imagery. Um, Talk about that because the language just seems so different. You, you you felt that you feel that the language is different. The um, languages are seem so different in their construction. Uh, yeah, the, the how, do you, how do you translate that lesson of precision from Chinese into English? The, you know, Chinese, I studied, for my undergraduate degree was in Chinese poetry, and I studied the Chinese poem deeply and heavily. You know, I, I was really into it. I was such a nerd, right? Um, but, the, the, you know, the chi classical Chinese poetry, uh, there's no inf inflectional morphology. You, I mean, there, uh, there, you know, there are no tenses. Uh, you know, uh, no, and ca you know, lack of case tense. I mean, uh, and, and some poems there aren't verbs. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, it's 
it's so concise and precise, mm -hmm. and the imagery is you know, uh, so precise that I try to bring that into the in, you know my English poet, uh, my writing, and that's I think um, I think that's uh, I, that's why I've been developing in, in a Chinese American aesthetics, yes. a Chinese American quatrain, a Chinese American poem, where I borrow from the ancient Chinese Chinese poetry. Um, and try to bring bring that precision into the you know my uh, so, you know uh, some of my poems. Um, you know I write different kinds of poems. I write long line poems and talky poems and and I sh you know some poems shout at you, but uh, but that some poems are really uh, influenced by Chinese poetry. And so um, so yeah, I just it's it's a wonderful puzzle for me to to try to bring Chinese poetry into um, you know, in, uh, into the Western world. And it, is, it is wonderful for us. Uh, here's a poem that captures, I imagine, what your mother went through, but what so many women go through. Which, which one? This side here. Oh, this one. Ron Charles. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You, you should have told me what poems not to ask you to read. <laughs> Okay, this one is called Variations on an Ancient Theme, The Drunken Husband, right? Uh, and um, this, okay, these are written in octaves uh, and fashioned after Du Fu's octaves, his, uh, his luxure. I just, uh, okay, I, I won't get into the geeky uh, information regarding that form, but, uh, but there's also this, these folk songs, these ancient folk songs that, that talk about drunken husbands. They would come home, these drunken husbands would come home, and, the, and of course, the woman would, would wait for him in her finest, you know, outfits, and she would forgive him for, his, you know, after he's, you know, uh, come home from the brothel. Of course, these poems were written by men, right? So, so yeah, so I, uh, I talk back to those poets, and, and so, the, and there's a dog that goes through these, this poem, and in Chinese poetry, there's often this bark, this dog that is, that he's often the harbinger of good luck, of, of good news. But in, in this sequence, uh, he's a har harbinger of bad news. And, um, and this is my, one of my issue poems about domestic violence. So, uh, and these are different vignettes, of, these are vignettes of different, uh, different situations, different uh, families. Um, variations on an ancient theme, the drunken husband. The dog is barking at the door. Daddy crashed the car. Hush, kids, go to your room. Don't come out until it's over. He stumbles in the dim-lit stairs, drops his Levi's to his ankles. Touch me and I'll kill you, she says, pointing a revolver at his head. The dog is barking at the door. She doesn't recognize the master. She sniffs his guilty crotch, positioned to bite it off. Jesus, control your dog. A man can't come back to his castle. Kill him, Ling Ling, she sobs, curlers bobbing on her shoulders. The dog is barking at the door. Quiet spot, let's not wake her. The bourbon is sour on his breath, lipstick on his proverbial collar. He turns on the computer in the den. He calms the dog with a bone. Upstairs, she sleeps facing the wall, dreaming about the perfume river. The dog is barking at the door. He stumbles in, swinging. Where is my gook of a wife? Where are my half-breed monsters? There is silence up the cold stairs, no movement. No answer. The drawers are open like graves. The closets agape to the rafters. The dog is barking at the door. He stumbles in singing. How is my teenage bride? How is my mail order darling? Perhaps she's pretending to be asleep, waiting for her man's hard cock. He enters her from behind. Her sobbing does not deter him. The dog is barking at the door. What does the proud beast know? 
who is both master and intruder, whose bloody handprint on the wall, whose revolver in the dishwasher. The neighbors won't heed her alarm. She keeps barking, barking, bent on saving their kind. I, I think domestic violence will do us in. We just. Uh, That's a I, devastating poem. Yeah, it's. Um, and you say that it, you've borrowed from a Chinese form and even a Chinese theme. So it's not just a translation, it's a transformation of that form that's a, yeah, that's into a, a very different kind of poem. Right, right. I, I, use, I use the, uh, the formal base, but then I bring in you know, c uh, contemporary themes and ideas and, and issues. I, just, I, I see myself as an activist poet, and I, have, uh, I write about the issues of the day. And, um, and also, it's per what's personal is political, and, and yes. my family is just uh, filled with uh, which strife and, um, and and yeah and therefore I'm, I feel like I must I must write about about it. Um, What's so chilling is you know each of those uh, are they quatrains? Uh, they're, uh, they're octaves. Yeah. Octaves. Each of them is parallel. Each of them very similar, but each of them different in different cultures at different times, obviously. Uh, but it's essentially the same story over and over again. Right. It, it reminds me, of course, of Dr. Ford's testimony when women all over the country said, yes, that's exactly, I mean, people in my own family told me, yes, that's exactly what happened to me at a party. Yeah. Everyone's had this happen, apparently. Y yes, and, and women's issue. I mean, I mean, I wrote this poem, like, what, yeah, 20 years ago, and it's, you know, and, the th and it's universal. Yes. It, we're still suffering from, you know, um, from domestic, from violence. And uh, the denial of it. And denial, That's all yeah. part of it. It's acting like it never happens or being surprised. And, and yeah, so, yeah, that's, that's why these, you know, uh, certain poems live on. I, that, you know, they're, uh, they're, un they're universal. Um, Every woman has her own chimera. <laughs> that's a very different kind of feminist poem, right? <laughs> I wrote this poem for Audrey and Rich. Did you know Audrey and Rich? Yeah? Of course. Uh, I, I can't have you read the, we won't get the whole thing, but just, uh, you'll see when it's done. You want to, uh, shall I read this? I've got a little mark on the other side. Next page. I, I stop here. I read, okay. Thank you. Yeah, I wrote this suite for uh, Audrey and Rich. Every woman is her own chimera. Every woman is her own chimera. Today she is laughing with Julio. Tonight she is dancing with Coolio. <laughs> How long can happiness last? For a slow, brief afternoon, my head on the thigh of a sequoia reading Wang Wei. Butterfly in mouth, but don't bite down. Whose life is it anyway? She born of chrysalis and shit or she born a woman in pain. Mei Ling brings a wounded poem, cry, crying, please mommy, mommy, fix it. You wipe the tears from her cheek, then glue a gnat's torn wing. The sand dab flicks her tail, the tears of the wombat are green. Kiss me against the last hydrangea, comrades, we are not yet free. Yeah. Women aren't just victims in your poems. They <laughs> push back. Oh yeah, they talk back, they push back. They fight back. They fight back. <laughs> they, they <laughs> what they say about a woman at 45, too late to live, too soon to die. <laughs> my wine is bittersweet, my song is rye. You go on to talk about other parts of your body which I will not read. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, he's afraid of the C word, <laughs> or the and the V word. He's afraid of. <laughs> but it is very funny. Uh, it's, it's a very funny poem. <laughs> There's a V word, oh, okay, and a C word, okay. In the afterward to uh, the Phoenix Gone, you write, "I have not been rehabilitated in middle age. In fact, I want to reassure my friends that I am as feisty as ever," which we've clearly seen. 
<laughs> I am still very much an activist poet who believes in my work, my life work, to infuse my art with three powers, to inspire, to illuminate, and to liberate. How does poetry do those things? Oh, as Arden says, Poetry makes nothing happen, right? <laughs> 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 well, it's, it's important uh, that the poet believes that you know, she can do these things. Yes. It's important for the poet to, to have this grand uh, uh, scheme of, you know, of things. Um, um, I don't know. This is, this, I just uh, reti retired from my full-time teaching job. I'm going to you know, run around the country and talk about poetry. And, and bring the good news, you right. know, present the good news. And it's, it's important, I think. Your poems do that, but they also push back at our temptation to speak in a grandiose way about poetry. Right, right. There several witty lines here. The poet guards the conscience of society. <laughs> no, you're wrong. <laughs> she stands lonely on that hillock observing the pastures. Later you say, I do hate my loneliness, sitting cross-legged in my room, satisfied with a few off rhymes, sending off precious haiku to some inconspicuous journal named Left-Leaning Bamboo. <laughs> it's such a great satire of the poet. And finally, <laughs> how could we write poetry in a time like this? A discipline that makes a, so much ado about so little. Willfully laconic, deceptively disguised as a love poem. I mean, you implicitly challenge poetry not to claim more than it can do. Right, right. And, well, I, but I still love the genre. <laughs> oh, yes. You know, I, it's, the, it's a genre that's closest to our hearts. When you're sad and lonely and angry, you write a little poem, you know, you write poems, you know? Yes. And so, um, yeah, yeah, I just, well, you know, a poet, so we're, 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 the, we're the stepchildren of literature, are we? No, <laughs> no, you're the queens and kings. <laughs> what are you laughing? <laughs> uh, <laughs> There's a wonderful uh, tribute poem here. I want you to read the, uh, the first part, and this will be the end. I read here? Yes. Okay. But this, I wrote this for my f uh, friend, the activist poet, Mitsu Yamada, do you know any, yeah, she's, yeah, I wrote for her 90th birthday, and. Uh, she's still alive? She's still alive, she's 93, and she calls me and says, when you gonna come and visit me, I might not have long, <laughs> you know, I, I might have another year, and so it's, she's really great, but she's, she, she was one of the, uh, fir, you know, first uh, Asian American poets that I read, and her, um, and her father was I interned, um, you know, during, uh, she would, uh, had, you know, was taken away to an internment camp um, for Mitsu Yamada on her 90th birthday. They say we bitch revolutionaries never go out of fashion. Like look how fashionable I am. <laughs> Wearing floppy hats and huge wedgie shoes. A feather bandolera and a lethal python. Sometimes we wear a fro perm because we hate our straight hair. Sometimes we wear it straight like the, to the ankles like Mirasaki. I bleach mine purple to look like Kwanan Cycloc. Maxine's beaming like the goddess of Nai Nai Temple, a cross between Storm the Exco and Asoha Tano. We love our laser eyes, our Yoko granny glasses are dizzy. Short women poets unite. Revolution ain't just style, it's destiny. <laughs> remember, remember those spiral perms? I don't know, you guys are too young. <laughs> you guys, uh, the spiral perms in the uh, 80s, you know, I, I had, ugh, yeah. <laughs> it's been such a pleasure to talk to you tonight. Thank oh, you so much. Thank you. It's, the hour's over? I can't <laughs> believe it. Just there are, poem book, there are po collections for sale in the lobby. Uh, please fill out the uh, questionnaires and uh, feel free to come up and talk to me. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.